Hello, everybody. Welcome. I'm Beth Johnston. I'm the Chief Community Engagement Officer here at the FSHD Society. And today here with my colleagues, June, June Kinoshita and Dr. Jamshid Arjaman, um, we'd like to welcome you to our FSHD University webinar. So the FSHD Society offers these free webinars and so many other educational events to educate and empower everyone affected by FSHD to become their own best advocates. So today from the Ohio State University's College of Medicine and the Center for Gene Therapy at Nationwide Children's Hospital, we welcome Dr. Nazar Saad. Um, he will be giving us an overview on the therapeutic landscape of FSHD and some updates on his on ongoing research. That's really exciting. I can't wait to hear about that. So I'll turn it over to you and welcome Dr. Saad. Okay, great. Thank you, Beth. Thank you, June and Jamshid and the whole FSHD Society and the community members for joining this meeting today. And uh, I'm very happy to give uh, an educational session about the new uh, treatments for FSHD. So shall I share my slide here? Yes. Oh, just give me. Okay. Okay, hopefully you can see it. Perfect. Awesome, so um, I'll get going. We're actually seeing your, not the presenter slide, sorry. We're uh, seeing the background, if you can switch screens. Yeah, that's perfect. Okay, awesome, great. Uh, so uh, let's get started. So therapeutic applications for FSHD. I mean, uh, for you who has uh, been affected with FSHD or any of your family members. I mean, you've be, you've been uh, getting familiar with the therapeutic landscape for FSHD. Some of you have undergone surgical interventions or uh, are doing physical therapy to um, to uh, cope up with the uh, disease progression. But also uh, on the other side, uh, scientists uh, around the world are trying to uh, develop uh, novel molecular therapies uh, or drug therapies to um, either uh, cure the disease or halt the progression of the disease. And uh, these therapies can be um, divided into uh, either uh, DEX4 targeting therapies, and those are mostly uh, RNA-based or uh, gene therapy-based therapies that are specifically targeting the DEX4 messenger RNA. And uh, other uh, therapies are uh, like drug therapies uh, using uh, small molecules to, um, to uh, affect or uh, target uh, downstream molecular pathways activated by DEX4 in muscle cells. And the third uh, option is to use cell therapy or stem cell therapy. So I'll be talking about uh, the molecular part and the drug part and the cell therapy part, and I will finish by um, providing some uh, new update on uh, a project I'm working on to identify uh, blood biomarkers for FSHD. So this is the outline here. We'll go and start with the DEX4 targeting therapies. So as most of you know, FSHD is an autosomal dominant muscular disease, and no need to uh, talk more about it because um, most of you know uh, the background and the genetics of the disease. Uh, and so the important thing here is that we know that there is an abnormal expression of DEX4, which is a transcription factor, uh, an abnormal expression of that transcription factor in skeletal muscles. So, um, and the expression of DEX4 uh, follows the central dogma of molecular biology. What I mean by that is that uh, DEX4 is encoded in uh, the chromosome 4Q35 uh, uh, section in the genomic DNA. It is transcribed uh, to form a messenger RNA that is exported into the cytoplasm of the cell. And that messenger RNA is used as a information to produce the DEX4 protein. <clears throat> once, the, once the DEX4 protein is there, it will, uh, it will do what we all know uh, it's doing uh, by reducing the function and, um, um, and weakening the skeletal muscles. So, and this is also has been shown uh, on multiple occasions in different um, mouse models and other animal models. And just to give you here an example of how widespread the skeletal muscle is um, 
the, the damage of, of DUX4 uh, in, in, in the skeletal muscle. Uh, when we injected DUX4 into a, a mouse skeletal muscle, and you see how much the widespread damage is there compared to a, a control-treated skeletal muscle. So we know that DUX4 is toxic and uh, it causes deregulation of gene expression. And uh, a list is long, uh, starting from oxidative stress, creating inflammation and inducing muscle uh, weakening and atrophy. So scientists um, thought that the best route to FSHD therapy is by targeting the DUX4 itself. Um, so by targeting the DUX4 itself, you will be inhibiting the DUX4 protein function or the expression of the DUX4 protein. So uh, in this way, you would be allowing to um, give beneficial therapeutic effect uh, for FSHD patients. So the first example using uh, DUX4 targeting therapies to target DUX4 messenger RNAs are called uh, either siRNAs, ASOs, or U7 antisense DUX4, or the CRISPR editing technology and also the microRNA-based gene therapy. So most, uh, probably most of you have heard of these terms, and uh, but um, some of you don't know how they uh, work and what are the extent of the, the and the effectiveness of these therapies. So uh, to start, I mean, those, uh, again, uh, those therapies are designed to target the DEX4 messenger RNA and inhibit expression of DEX4 protein, and they can be divided into viral and non-viral based therapies uh, based on how you deliver those uh, therapies. For the non-viral based therapies, they can be delivered using either lipid nanoparticles or uh, conjugated with small protein sequences called peptides or conjugated by uh, with antibodies. So for the siRNA, it uses a mechanism uh, that is found in the in any of the human cells called RNA interference. So basically, what you need to know is that the siRNA is a small uh, piece of uh, single-stranded nucleic acid that recognizes the DUX4 messenger RNA and induces degradation of that messenger RNA or inhibition of translation or uh, uh, protein synthesis. So um, same thing or uh, a little bit uh, um, uh, similar in principle is the antisense oligonucleotide um, therapy. And it uses also another small sequence uh, of uh, nucleic acids to target the ductal messenger RNA. But instead of using the RNA interference mechanism in the cell, it uses another mechanism called RNAs H. And uh, RNAs H is an enzyme that also recognizes this a complex and also degrade the DUX4 messenger RNA, leading to the same uh, outcome. For the viral-based therapies, or uh, as known as gene therapies, uh, they are used uh, by um, and, and delivered using adeno-associated virus, or AAV, to transfer genetic material uh, to treat or prevent the disease. And so AAV is a, a virus-like particle uh, that has a protein capsid, and inside that uh, capsid, you have a genomic, uh, a, a viral genome that uh, you would be able to put any of your um, therapeutic gene uh, to uh, use it for uh, for gene therapy for FSHD. So it can be divided into either using a um, AAV therapy for gene replacement. So you would be replacing a defective gene um, with AAV or uh, using it to, um, to produce or affect gene silencing or gene correction using CRISPR. And we will see that uh, throughout the presentation. So just to give you first an overview about how AAV vector uh, goes into the cell. So the AAV vector has receptors that can, it binds to uh, cell receptors on the surface of the cell and enters the cell go through the cytoplasm and uh, is delivered again into the nucleus where it sheds its capsid and releases its viral genome. When the viral genome is in the nucleus, you have all the molecular machinery found uh, there to allow its, um, uh, to allow its uh, packaging into an episomal DNA and then also transcription into uh, RNA. This is essential because once the RNA is produced, you will have your therapy 
uh, produced in the cell and it will be ready to uh, do what it's supposed to do. So first, uh, I'll be talking uh, quickly about CRISPR, or uh, most of you have heard about CRISPR and uh, the potential of using CRISPR editing to uh, treat uh, genetic diseases. So CRISPR, uh, I'm sorry, this is a little bit busy slide, but the CRISPR um, uh, therapeutic uses a, uh, another enzyme like scissors and a guide RNA that allows those scissors to be guided towards the DEX4 messenger RNA. And um, this is what I'm talking about here, and it's called CRISPR-Cas9. So what it does is uh, mostly, and some studies have shown uh, its effectiveness in targeting the, uh, the 4QA allele region. And uh, as most of you know, this is uh, the uh, one other genetic um, requirement to have FSHD is the presence of that uh, haplotype 4QA. And uh, the CRISPR-Cas9 is designed to target that region and uh, inhibit DEX4 uh, production. Another way to do CRISPR is to use a scissor, but the scissor that does not cut, it's called deactivated Cas9. And instead of, like, not, instead of cutting, it uses uh, another mechanism to silence the region uh, or the D4-Z4 repeats where DEX4 is there. And also you will get same result where you have no longer expression of the DEX4 protein. So um, another mechanism using CRISPR is called CRISPR-Cas13. And this is um, a technology that has been developed in the Harper lab. And CRISPR-Cas13, instead of targeting the genomic DNA where uh, DEX4 is encoded, it targets the messenger RNA of DEX4. So um, same principle, you will have uh, another uh, type of scissors where you have a guide RNA that guides towards the DEX4 messenger RNA target. And with that, you would be able to induce degradation of DEX4 messenger RNA and also inhibition of DEX4 protein. Another mechanism using the U7 antisense DEX4 uh, therapy, and this is also uh, being developed by the Harper lab, and uh, this therapy targets, uh, again, the DEX4 messenger RNA in its um, processed form or uh, targets the DEX4 messenger RNA when it's being uh, processed to be uh, functional. And uh, these therapies, they either block the DEX4 protein synthesis or uh, they destabilize the DEX4 messenger RNA and uh, induce its degradation. And this is an example of a small piece of data that has already been published two, three years ago and uh, showing uh, in, uh, in brown dots the DEX4 uh, messenger RNA. And when uh, those cells have been given the therapy, the U7 antisense DEX4, you will see how much the DEX4 messenger RNA is reduced, showing effectiveness of the therapy. So I would like to switch to another method that has been developed uh, by uh, my work uh, that I've done in the Harper lab and uh, some other uh, microRNA therapies done by uh, other colleagues in the Harper lab. And it's called the microRNA-based um, gene therapy to target DEX4 messenger RNA. And again, this uh, microRNA-based gene therapy targets DEX4 messenger RNA and uses the RNA interference mechanism that is found in any human cells. And uh, this RNA interference mechanism has been, um, has been uh, discovered um, like uh, I think 20 years ago and uh, Dr. Fire and Mello received the Nobel Prize for the discovery of that mechanism. And it's really effective in targeting and inhibiting uh, gene expression. So as you see here, as RNAi is equivalent, RNA interference is equivalent, equivalent to gene silencing. So you have two types of microRNA-based gene therapies. Either you would use the naturally occurring microRNAs, and this is the work I, I did in the Harper lab. And uh, another way to do is to design artificially uh, designed microRNAs that could also target DEX4 messenger RNA. So I'll start with the natural occurring one. The natural occurring one, it means that we're um, looking at 
uh, microRNAs that are found normally in skeletal muscles, sorry, and uh, we've validated those uh, to be targeting dax messenger RNAs and inhibit gene silence and, and, and uh, do gene silencing and inhibit dax expression. And this method has been validated and published in 2021. And we used uh, AAV-based gene therapy with it, uh, where here uh, we showed its effectiveness when uh, that therapy is uh, co-injected into the TA muscle of a mouse, and it's can co-injected with AAV DEX4. So uh, that muscle would be um, here, for example, that muscle would be co-injected with the DEX4 that induces the uh, disease and uh, also injected with the microRNA that targets DEX4. So our expectation that that microRNA would uh, prevent DEX4 from inducing muscle toxicity, which what we saw. And uh, as you can see, the muscle toxicity here is very widespread when the DEX4 uh, is expressed in skeletal muscle without the microRNA. Um, this is to show you a quick um, data that we have showing that this microRNA, which is, with this natural microRNA called MIR675, when injected with AAV, is not toxic into skeletal muscles uh, at the three month endpoint. Another thing with, that we've discovered, but we have not published yet, is that um, MIR675 inhibits myostatin expression. Why myostatin is important? Myostatin is a, a normally uh, known to be inhibiting muscle growth. So by inhibiting the inhibitor, you would be uh, hoping to induce muscle growth. And so we've shown uh, by doing our uh, by doing molecular experiments that uh, MIR675 was able to inhibit the expression of myostatin. So with uh, with that natural microRNA would be hitting two birds in one stone. We would be targeting DEX4, but at the same time would be inhibiting myostatin and allowing uh, muscle to grow. And um, uh, myostatin targeting therapies in FSHD is uh, relatively more promising than uh, applying that therapy in other diseases like the DMD because st there are studies shown that the levels of myostatin in FSHD is still um, decreased compared to healthy controls, but it's still uh, at, a, um, uh, at a high level where uh, it can be targeted. So these are um, molecular data or in vitro data showing that we were able to inhibit uh, the expression of uh, the human and the mouse, mouse myostatin using the MIR-675 microRNA. And we were able to show that in mice at the same time, and also able to show that the treated TA muscle was able to gain uh, some, uh, some, some weight. We also applied and validated this therapy using uh, the FSHD mouse model, the TikTok mouse model developed by the Harper lab. And this mouse model needs to be given tamoxifen to induce the expression of DEX4. And once DEX4 is there, you will have muscle damage. So we've tested this therapy again, uh, but this time we injected the AEV um, expressing the MIR-675 microRNA into the gastronomous muscle. And we've, we've shown that um, with the therapy, we were able to reduce uh, muscle uh, damage uh, that was quantified by counting how many uh, fibers have regenerated. And also, um, uh, you can see here on the histopathology section of the untreated, where you have uh, regenerated fibers characterized by the presence of the nucleus into the center of the myofiber. And uh, you see a reduction in the number of those myofibers in the treated uh, muscle. We were also able to see that um, MIR-675 was able to, uh, uh, to, to perform target engagement. It means that was able to reduce the expression of DEX4. So um, just to sum up this, uh, this, uh, this work, the MIR-675 based gene therapy could be promising. Um, and it uses a naturally occurring microRNA that is normally expressed in skeletal muscle. Uh, we use the AEV gene therapy to uh, overexpress and uh, overproduce that microRNA in skeletal muscle. 
uh, to uh, perform and uh, affect gene silencing to reduce the expression of DUX4 and myostatin. So with the hope to uh, induce muscle, muscle growth and also to uh, prevent DUX4-induced toxicity in skeletal muscles. So another way to use microRNA is, as I said, to use the artificially designed microRNAs. The difference between the artificially designed microRNA and the naturally occurring one is the way uh, the microRNA uh, binds to the uh, DUX4 target messenger RNA. With the naturally occurring, occurring one, you have some uh, mismatch, mismatches uh, between the nucleic acids. Uh, however, with the artificially designed one, you have a 100% uh, complementarity between the microRNA and the target messenger RNA uh, sequence. So with this, you would hope that with an artificially designed one, uh, you would have higher therapeutic efficacy, which uh, what you also uh, see uh, when uh, tested in cells and in mice. Uh, so again, that uh, artificially designed microRNA would induce gene silencing and uh, prevent DUX4 production. And uh, those are uh, previously published data showing the effectiveness of those microRNAs in uh, reducing DUX4 uh, muscle damage. Uh, and uh, uh, and uh, you would see here with the uh, microRNA that is uh, co-injected with DUX4 in skeletal muscle, how the muscle is really, uh, is really uh, in, in, in a good shape and uh, you don't see any signs of DUX4-induced toxicity, which is very promising. So here I want to switch gears to talk about direct therapy. And uh, so uh, it started by uh, working on the naturally occurring MIR-675 microRNA. So as I told you, uh, this is a natural occurring microRNA found in skeletal muscles. So uh, the um, idea of using drug therapy uh, is to use those drugs to induce the expression of that natural microRNA. But instead of using uh, AEV gene therapy, we would be using small molecules or drugs to induce the expression of that microRNA in skeletal muscles. Um, but before talking about that, I would like to remind you about another drug therapy that is being developed by Fulcrum Therapeutics. And this uh, drug therapy using the Lozmapimod uh, drug uh, does not target the microRNA, but it has an indirect way of targeting DUX4 by inhibiting a, a, a pathway called P38 MAPK uh, pathway that is uh, downstream DUX4. So DUX4 activates that pathway, and um, by activating that pathway, you would have uh, muscle damage. So the idea from Fulcrum is that uh, Lozmapimod would target that pathway, and you would reduce DUX4-induced damage. So, so far, they have uh, very encouraging data uh, in their phase 2B clinical trial that has been um, done before, uh, which is called the Redox phase 2B uh, clinical trial. Um, that when they looked at the DUX4 gene expression and uh, the biomarkers for uh, muscle biomarkers for DUX4, they didn't see difference, but uh, they saw differences in the, um, in the, in the MRI on, muscle, on skeletal muscles and uh, when they measured fatty infiltration. They also saw significant improvement in uh, the uh, reachable workspace. So that's another clinical outcome measure. Uh, that uh, Fulcrum Therapeutics tested and showed uh, significance in that, um, in that clinical outcome measure. Uh, they also uh, show that Lozmapimod is well tolerated and doesn't have any serious drug-related adverse events. They are uh, now in their, in, in their uh, phase three clinical trial. Uh, and um, I think that would complete uh, the phase three clinical trial enrollment by the second half of 2023. You can have more information by going and clicking on that uh, link uh, to, to get more information about the clinical trial. So uh, just to give you an overview about the trial, it's a global randomized, uh, double-blinded, placebo-controlled um, uh, clinical trial, meaning that uh, you will have a... Um, you will have a placebo-treated group and a drug-treated group, and um, it's uh, blinded. So 
uh, double blinded, so we don't know uh, which who, who's taking the placebo or who's taking the drug. It is it is eligible for uh, patients between 18 and 65 years from all sexes, and the study will evaluate the safety and the therapeutic efficacy of losmapimod in in treating patients with FSHD. So um, they uses 15. They're gonna be using 15 milligram of losmapimod. Uh, or a placebo twice daily by mouth, and they will be using clinical outcome measures uh, as primary outcome measures to assess the efficiency of the therapy, uh, like the reachable works workspace, and as secondary outcome measures, additional uh, clinical uh, assessments. So um, just to go back to the uh, therapy I, uh, I worked on in the Harper Lab, which is now the therapy to induce the expression of the microRNA MIR 675. So um, we have published, uh, we have shown and published data showing that some of the drugs that we've tested, like the beta estradiol uh, or a, the combination of that drug with a uh, analog for progesterone and the melatonin, were able to increase the expression of MIR 675 in skeletal muscle, as shown here in some of the muscle cell lines taken from patients uh, and um, tested with the drugs, uh, as you can see here, increase of the levels of MIR-675 compared, compared to uh, cells treated with the, uh, with the control. And also uh, at the same time, we've seen reduction uh, of DAX4 levels and a reduction of um, DAX4 biomarker levels. So this is also promising. We've tested uh, some of, uh, one of those drugs in mice uh, using the tick ducks mouse model, uh, but also we've shown uh, in uh, black six control mice uh, when we give tamoxifen that uh, uh, sorry when we give melatonin uh, that melatonin was able to increase the levels of mir six seventy five in the muscles of those mice. So uh, as I said, we are uh, also testing those drugs in the tick ducks mouse model and uh, we'll be showing uh, data as we, uh, as we get them out. And hopefully uh, it will uh, be also uh, functional and uh, effective in, in, in the text mouse model. So as an overview for um, the, development, the development pipeline for FSHD therapies, so you have multiple therapies uh, at different levels, uh, like the Lizmapumad is the most advanced one, uh, is going to be reaching is, is is has reached phase three trial and also you have some of the assay RNA the anti sense oligo um, therapeutics that are in phase one and two clinical trials. In addition to the other therapies that I talked about, like the microRNA based gene therapy and or the CRISPR or the U7 or the small molecule inducers of MU695, those are still in uh, the R and D or the preclinical studies. Um, that would prepare us to um, have a better, uh, uh, to prepare us to move to the clinical trials. So now I'd like to switch and talk about some of the novel therapeutic perspectives for FSHD that are done in my lab uh, that I started a year ago at Children's Hospital. So the rationale behind uh, developing those novel therapies for FSHD is um, I would like to treat the phenotypic outcome uh, in FSHD. As you know, uh, those targeted therapies have uh, a lot of promise, but also they could have some challenges because of the low availability of DAX4 in uh, skeletal muscles. So uh, other alternatives uh, to develop tre uh, treatments that could target the phenotypic outcomes of FSHD, such as muscle atrophy, uh, inflammation in the muscle, and uh, fat infiltration in, in the muscle. So uh, the idea is to use those therapies to ameliorate uh, skeletal muscle environment and to build back weakened skeletal muscle. So uh, the way to do that was to start using uh, stem cell derived therapies. Uh, but instead of using stem cells per se, I would be using uh, some products released from stem cells called extracellular vesicles or exosomes um, that uh, can be also effective uh, similar to the stem cells. So a quick overview about exosomes. So those exosomes are uh, released 
in the environment from cells. So as you can see here in the schematic, you have a cell here, and the cell would be released, will be releasing those exosomes. They are uh, of a circular shape. They have a bilipid bilayer, and inside of those um, vesicles, you have a lot of information you can uh, you can read like DNA, microRNA, RNA, proteins, and um, uh, they can uh, have a size between 30 to 150 nanometers. So it's uh, very small, but very effective and have very high potential for therapeutics. And uh, so you need a, an, an electron microsco a microscopy to be able to see those, uh, those vesicles. So um, any cell type can produce uh, those exosomes. And uh, they uh, are used by cell uh, for communication. It's like a, a bottle that you have a message that you put in it and you, uh, th that you uh, toss it in the sea. And that's a message that the cell is sending to another uh, to another cell to give instructions to do um, to do to do uh, to do some things that um, like for example a stress message from one cell to another uh, and etc. So those EVs or exosomes can be found in biological fluids. So once they are released from cells, they will be found in biological fluids like blood, urine. Um, any other biologic fluid you can think of. They, as I said, they contain multiple molecules listed here. So the idea of using exosomes would be to, over to overcome the stem cell therapy challenges. So uh, scientists have tried to use stem cell, uh, stem cell therapy for FSHD, but they had uh, a lot of challenges um, like uh, production of stem cells. It's very slow. Uh, once uh, stem cells are produced and uh, injected into skeletal muscles, uh, they have uh, they found hard time having uh, those stem cells engrafted in the uh, diseased skeletal muscle environment, and they were not able to spread and proliferate. So, which is a requirement for an effective stem cell therapy. Um, so, uh, the exosome-based therapy will build on the stem cell therapy because it uses those exosomes released from stem cells. And uh, stem cells exert their function by releasing those exosomes and by releasing those messages that you can find in those exosomes. So, that's why exosomes are known to recapitulate stem cell function. They can do the same function as stem cells. So the idea is to inject those exosomes instead of using the cell, the stem cells. And um, those exosomes can be used as adjunct or additional therapy uh, in conjunction with other uh, DEX4 targeting therapies. And probably they could be also used to enhance the environment of the skeletal muscle and makes um, stem cell therapy more uh, efficacious. So, um, in uh, my work, I've started working on uh, some uh, EVs or exosomes collected from mesenchymal stem cells uh, taken from uh, human bone marrow. And um, first, I tested whether, those, whether injecting those MSC exosomes into the skeletal muscle of mice is toxic or not, which I did not see uh, toxicity in the conditions I tested. Uh, of course, there are uh, going to be further assessment in and their toxicity using other doses and time points. And here, this is a quick data uh, using the TIGDAX mouse, where I show that those exosomes injected in the gas of uh, the TIGDAX mouse uh, producing low levels of DAX4, uh, I see some um, uh, beneficial effect of those EVs uh, exemplified by uh, reduction in a severity score when we assessed the uh, histopathology of those uh, skeletal muscles injected uh, with the MSC EV exosomes and compared with untreated uh, skeletal muscles. So we saw, for example, 17% reduction in fibrosis uh, by doing a specific stain that can look at fibrosis in skeletal muscles. And this is also uh, done in uh, another model where you have high levels of DEX4, uh, where we were able to see reduced uh, damage uh, from uh, muscles treated with the, with the exosomes in two different muscle types. 
and you can see here uh, the damage highlighted in blue, uh, and uh, you can see some differences between the treated and the untreated uh, muscles uh, in the TA and also in the gas. In the gas, the untreated muscle, you have inflammation and infiltration of um, um, of, of mononuclear cells like uh, immune cells, but in the treated uh, exosomes, you have reduced infiltration, meaning that those exosomes have a certain therapeutic effect. So finally, I would like to finish by talking about another project I've started, uh, is to look at circulating exosomes uh, to validate non-invasive uh, molecular biomarkers for FSHD. So uh, those circulating exosomes from blood, they can provide a concentrated so source of cell-free RNA and protein. So those, remember, those are the messages that the skeletal muscle cells or the skeletal muscle is releasing into the environment and they get to the blood. So I'm trying to read those messages sent by skeletal muscles in the blood. And uh, the idea is to identify a novel circulating RNA and proteins that can be uh, selectively packaged into those exosomes released from skeletal muscles. So the goal would be um, to uh, also correlate uh, the whatever I found as message in those exosomes in the blood with the, uh, uh, the pathophysiology state of the diseased skeletal muscle. And so this is exemplified here. So the idea I would be looking at exosomes released from the skeletal muscle into the bloodstream, into the bloodstream, and um, for with that, once uh, if we were able to identify some uh, specific messages for FSHD, uh, we would be able to develop biomarkers um, or circulating blood biomarkers as uh, minimally invasive clinical outcome measures that can be used to diagnose FSHD or to predict the severity and uh, its onset and the progression of the disease. Uh, those uh, biomarkers that can be also used uh, to put patients uh, that are participating in clinical trials into homogeneous group that has similar disease manifestation and progression rate, which will accelerate uh, therapeutic validation and uh, give some sort of a, a better guarantee that uh, those uh, therapies would be uh, effective in, in, in FSHD patients. And also those biomarkers can be used to assess therapeutic efficacy, where um, we, would, we would use them to see whether they would, be, they would disappear when we have an effective therapy. So um, the way the study will, do, will, will go is uh, we'll be collecting blood from patients and uh, we would be um, extracting those exosomes from blood uh, using certain techniques that are, um, um, that are uh, developed in the lab. And once those exosomes are purified, we would be extracting the messages that they have, like the RNA and the proteins, and we would be doing some sophisticated transcriptomic and proteomic um, techniques to look at um, whole RNA and whole protein uh, profile in those exosomes. So, and those techniques are called next generation sequencing for um, for um, the technique to look at the RNA and mass spectrometry like proteom proteomics to look at the proteins. So, uh, so far, uh, I would be uh, I would be looking. Sorry, I would be looking for. Uh, FSHD patients that um, would be willing to give um, to give blood for that uh, for that clinical study, and uh, hopefully would be able to set up something to have those uh, who are interested in donating blood uh, to have the blood uh, reach our lab, so we'll be able to continue the study. And so the take home message from uh, that presentation is that there are many FSHD therapies that are under development with some entering clinical, uh, like late clinical trials, phase three, like lozmapimod. Ducts for targeting therapies are very promising therapy, therapeutics, um, and um, they could uh, provide a paradigm, paradigm shift in FSHD uh, therapy where some of them could be uh, used as uh, cures for uh, FSHD hopefully. 
And also, uh, I've shown you uh, the uh, clinical uh, study I'm conducting to uh, look for circulating exosomes as uh, non-invasive biomarkers and the use of stem cell stem cells uh, stem cell exosomes uh, for uh, a therapeutic uh, alternative for FSHD. And so, finally, I would like to acknowledge uh, my team and uh, the collaborators at, at Children's Hospital, like. Uh, Scott Harper, uh, Dr. David Bristock, and Kevin Flanagan, um, who is uh, working with me for the clinical study, and uh, other collaborators outside outside Children's Hospital, like Dr. Robbie Tawil and uh, Dr. Kendall uh, from City of Hope, uh, that will help us perform the sophisticated transcriptomic analysis. And all the funding agencies that funded those projects, like the FSHD Society and other funding uh, entities, and uh, the recently uh, funded projects from the Chris Corino Foundation. And thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Nazar. Great presentation. I, I hopefully Beth will join me as well. Um, uh, I, um, I think we can take on some questions, but before we uh, attack the, or we go through all the questions that were sent, uh, I think there was a question um, that was, uh, that maybe we need to address. Somebody was concerned because they've been prescribed tamoxifen and it might be good if you can explain how tamoxifen is a switch that's in the tick uh, ducks more, uh, tick yeah. ducks for mouse model. It is not, it uh, doesn't naturally induce ducks for itself. But if you can maybe explain that, that'd be great. Yeah, true. Uh, sorry for the confusion. Tamoxifen, yes, as as uh, uh, Jamshi said, is not natural. Does not induce the expression of Dex4 at all. There's no data showing that. Um, we use tamoxifen as a tool to uh, induce expression of Dex4 uh, in the FSHD uh, mouse model uh, because there are some uh, responsive DNA sequences that we put um, uh, upstream of a um, uh, transgene, uh, which is DUX4, uh, allowing the expression of DUX4. So uh, in a normal natural setting, you would not have production or induction of DUX4 with tamoxifen at all. Yeah, thank you. So yeah, it's a, people need to realize the, the tick DUX4 mouse is a engineered mouse and uh, you know, right. people use very clever switches to turn things on. Uh, that normally would not happen, but is that's always a source of confusion because a lot of these switches are conventional um, drugs that are available. We know they're very effective, so they're using those same molecular uh, switches um, True. Towards, uh, like, to engineer uh, mice. So, yeah, like other uh, other uh, drugs like doxycycline that can also be used, and uh, there are other mouse models that use doxycycline to induce exactly. doxycycline. The same thing. Yeah. Great. Um, thank you. The, the great uh, coverage of the whole spectrum of uh, drug disease uh, or therapeutic uh, strategies. Uh, and um, maybe we can start off with some of the questions uh, um, related to the uh, 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 microRNAs, um, uh, endogenous microRNAs. So, yeah. um, uh, so there were some questions about, um, you know, how would the uh, MIR-675 or any other microRNAs be delivered? Uh, and do we know the sequences, maybe the, where MIR, uh, the naturally occurring MIR-675 uh, binds? Yes, so uh, let me show you here. So uh, uh, MIR-675 uh, can be used uh, using uh, AAV, uh, gene therapy, so that's the vector, adeno-associated vector. So you would put the sequence of the microRNA in the viral genome, and it will go into the cell, and it will be uh, producing the microRNA where it will become effective uh, in targeting the messenger RNA for DUX4. So it targets the uh, coding sequence of uh, DUX4 at multiple positions. Uh, we have validated two effective target sites for that microRNA, and uh, we've shown that MIR-675 MIR specifically target those sequences in uh, the DUX4 messenger RNA to uh, induce either uh, DUX4 messenger RNA degradation or inhibition of protein production. Great, thank you. And I think uh, um, along those same lines with uh, uh, 
uh, the 450 construct, the artificially designed one um, that is much more specific. I think one of the things that people may not yes. have uh, picked up on, uh, actually you had a slide where you showed all of the different uh, constructs yeah. that were tested. Um, right. It's it's all of the other one. Uh, I'm sorry, there's one where you kind of had the the whole Dux4 gene uh, on, and then all the little lines that represent all the different uh, microRNAs that you've uh, or uh, that you you tested. Yeah, I do not have it here. Uh, yeah, you you did you did show it. Just uh, if you can keep keep going forward. Oh, here, right? Yes, yeah. yes, yes. So this is a tremendous amount of work that uh, mm -hmm. I think uh, people don't don't realize. Every one of the little lines uh, up uh, above the little black lines, those are different constructs that your lab tested mm -hmm. um, to, to, and to see which one was most effective. And so that you guys selected the most uh, potent one, right? Exactly, the, which is the, the red one here shown exactly. here. Exactly. Yes. Um, so this That's is just, for people who don't realize this, this is a lot of work uh, that they've done and they just kind of are showing you the, the best results. Uh, and uh, so do we know if uh, 405 also uh, has similar antimyostatin uh, effects? No, uh, no, uh, we don't know if it has. And uh, since it has a different way of binding the messenger RNA of DEX4, uh, it is highly specific in uh, only targeting the DEX4 messenger RNA, which prevented from targeting other uh, messenger RNAs. The, the 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 beauty of the natural microRNAs uh, is since they do not have um, highly specificity to one specific messenger RNA, uh, nature has developed those microRNAs to be able to target multiple messenger RNAs at the same time. So uh, that's why we're trying to explode the, the 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 those properties of the natural microRNAs to uh, see whether you can uh, pick one microRNA like the MIR-675 that could be uh, beneficial on, on both sides, like targeting the toxic gene DUX4 and also target some other genes in skeletal muscle um, like myostatin that could make uh, additional benefits for uh, the therapy. Great. And there were several questions, I think, related to melatonin, the natural inducer of the... Um, um, do we know the, the mechanism of action? Um, For MIR-675, we do not know that. Uh, we only know that uh, it allows the overexpression of MIR-675, and we have evidence that this is a direct induction of MIR-675. Now, uh, we know that melatonin has other functions, like uh, has anti uh, uh, antioxidant uh, properties, um, uh, it could have some anti-inflammatory properties. So um, uh, that could also be uh, exploded uh, by using melatonin to uh, treat skeletal muscles. But uh, the um, direct mechanism to induce MIR-675, we do not know yet how it does it. Okay. And, and I think there were a couple of questions about since melatonin is available, I think it's sold as a, a, a sleep enhancer. Um, I know that when I travel and I cross, you know, time zones, I usually carry a little bit of melatonin to help me sleep. But um, <laughs> are, are those, uh, um, are people were asking, is this something to consider as a supplement to lower DUX4 levels naturally? Well, I mean, it has to be tested. I mean, it, I mean, we have to be, we have to, um, set up a, a clinical clinical trial for that. Um, I cannot recommend anything. Uh, you're gonna have to see uh, with your um, with, with your physician. Uh, but uh, I mean, so far, well, our test in, in, in cells and in mice indicates um, good benefits in it. But uh, yeah, other than that, I cannot recommend anything. Thank you. Um, Beth, do you see any? I'm sorry, I'm going through the questions. Can yeah, me too. I mean, we do have several folks that would like to um, donate blood. Yeah. So, Dr. Saad, um, how would they get in touch with you, or what's the best way for them to get their blood to you? Sure. Yeah. So we have uh, at Children's Hospital uh, a clinical study uh, that is uh, led by uh, Dr. Kevin Flanagan, 
and uh, we have a clinic here where we can receive uh, patients in Columbus, Ohio uh, at Nationwide Children's Hospital, where uh, we have a clinical team uh, who will be able to collect blood. And um, probably we are uh, plan thinking about organizing something um, along those lines to um, have gather to gather patients uh, and be able to collect blood. So, but this is not definitive yet. So we're it's it's in the discussions so far. Uh, but we'll keep you posted through the chapters or uh, through FSHD Society uh, about the about this uh, possibility. But for now, yeah, I mean, if you want to reach out to me and uh, I can um, connect you with our clinical team at Children's Hospital uh, to get the blood done, yeah. Great. Yeah, I'll just add on to that. Um, so National, Nationwide Children's is in near in the Columbus area. So if you're in and around Columbus, Ohio, that's easy. Um, and like um, Dr. Saad said, we'll be sending out information about an upcoming event that we'll, we'll be having a blood draw event actually so, to help that out. So um, definitely um, stay tuned for that. Um, Jamshid, a lot of these questions are like, I don't even... Yeah, yeah, I'm happy to, yeah, I was just getting, <laughs> going through them. So uh, the exosome studies, there's uh, several questions along those lines, and maybe I can try to group them together. Sure. Um, so uh, do you have any preliminary results on the uh, exosomes uh, data as a biomarker, maybe from um, a mouse study or from a, a dish study? Um, yeah, no, uh, so far we, we do not have, like, we have, we are conducting, so we have funding from the Chris Carino Foundation to look into these, into cells, uh, and also try to connect that uh, with uh, what we going to be identifying in blood, too. So those are two important uh, uh, access in the study, allowing us to uh, validate um, validate exosomes coming from skeletal muscles. So we're, we're conducting those at the same time. Great. And um, <clears throat> just there was a question about, uh, you know, where are the exosomes coming from? Are they just coming from muscle or, but you mentioned that, you know, mesenchymal stem cells, where do you expect the exosomes that you would find in the blood, the majority of them to come from? Yeah, so um, I cannot um, say for sure, but uh, I mean, definitely there are exosomes coming from other tissues and cells. And um, the challenge here and, um, and, and, and the idea is uh, to be able to distinguish those exosomes coming from tish other tissues and uh, exosomes coming from skeletal muscles. That would be uh, a great plus. But also at the same time, um, if uh, we are also interested in seeing any uh, marker or signature that uh, is associated with FSHD, um, uh, uh, how to say, uh, not without not necessarily coming from skeletal muscles. I mean, if we can find something coming from skeletal muscle, would be would be uh, a great plus because it will allow us to uh, use those markers to assess the, um, the 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 pathobiology state of the disease or or like the. Uh, disease state of the disease, but at the same time, uh, if we have, as I said, other markers that are uh, specific for FSHD, um, uh, like without being coming from skeletal muscles, that would be also good. So, great. And now, looking at exosomes more as a therapeutic uh, strategy, um, can um, you know, exosomes also be generated. You mentioned that the, the stem generating from stem cells might be challenging because growing stem cells uh, might be challenging. Is it possible to generate artificial exosomes and then load them up with what's the, the microRNAs or uh, cargo of interest? Um, I, I don't think so because it would be, um, you would be missing out uh, a lot of messages coming uh, that that the stem cells package in those exosomes to deliver. So uh, it's not just one message you will have in the exosome. So you will have a combination of those messages, and the combination of those messages uh, it, that what makes the exosomes therapeutic. So um, uh, so there are some stem cells that have um, 
So uh, you're going to have to distinguish between uh, growing stem cells to produce exosomes and, uh, and, and growing stem cells to a level that you can inject in a patient. Those are two different things. Mm -hmm. um, so there are uh, a lot more challenges in growing stem cells uh, for um, uh, patient administration versus uh, using stem cells to uh, as producers of exosomes. So, yeah. so from a therapeutic stance with exosomes, you would see this as a, is it a cell therapy that produces exosomes or would be intravenous exosome delivery? How do you envision that? Yeah, therapy? So, yeah. so I mean, uh, yeah, the, the vision would be to uh, use those, uh, it would be as an exosome therapy and uh, probably goes uh, under the biologics category. Uh, that could be uh, delivered intravenously. That's the hope, yeah. Great. And then there's a question here. Obviously, everybody is interested in combination therapies. It, would this be something that could uh, complement maybe losmapamod or any other drug that's yeah, being developed? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, uh, they could be uh, they could be complementing losmapamod, and it has to be tested in combination with that drug uh, or other, any other drugs. Um, but uh, there's potential for that, yeah. Great. Um, Beth, did you see anything else that I missed? I, I, I missed quite a few, unfortunately. There's, it's fantastic. We have uh, over 100 participants and people are sending emails um, and, um, or, or questions. Um, well, I think an overarching, um, <laughs> theory or not theory, but a over, overarching concern and, and Jam, she kind of touched on it just now is there are several trials that are coming down the pipeline for FSHD um, patients. And so um, from your perspective, um, what kind of guidance would you give um, a patient on um, how they would decide on the many trials coming down the pike and what, what should they participate in? Um, the concern that if you're participating in one, you won't be able to participate in another, but you kind of answered that with um, the fulcrum last month, but um, what, what guidance would you give us? Oh, that's a tough question. I mean, <laughs> uh, uh, I guess, I mean, uh, probably the first thing, I mean, they would have to consult their physician and see for each patient, what would be the best, uh, option for them to 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 use. I mean, uh, depending on uh, how uh, the disease is advanced in their case, or uh, whether they have other um, conditions. Uh, so, I mean, it, it's a hard question, and it's uh, uh, probably I cannot answer that. Uh, but as I said, yeah, there are other uh, leads like uh, your physician, your uh, your condition, your state, but. Uh, all these therapies have also their requirements. So uh, if you talk to your physician and uh, will tell you uh, whether uh, your condition could fit that requirement or not. So uh, that's what I recommend, yeah. Very good, thank you. Um, well, we have reached um, the top of our hour. I wanna respect everyone's time. Um, thank you so much. Uh, for joining us today and for all of answering all of our questions, all of the great information. Um, good luck with your study that you're doing, and we hope that okay. we can help um, supply some blood samples for you um, to pursue that study because that's a very, very important study to help in, in many clinical trials coming down the road. Yeah, um, great. Um, so thanks everyone else for attending and for all your great questions as well. Um, we will have two FSHD university webinars in May. Um, the first is on Thursday, May 4th. We've invited a speaker from Roche pharmaceutical company to describe their maneuver clinical trial for FSHD, which actually has begun recruiting participants in Denmark and they're planning uh, additional sites here in the U S and also in the UK. So that'll be exciting. That's on May 4th. And then on May 18th, we welcome um, one of Dr. Saad's colleagues at Ohio State University, uh, neurologist Dr. Bakri El Sheikh, who will speak about um, what every newly diagnosed person should know about their condition, their prognosis, managing symptoms, and so much more. So that's going to be great for not only newly diagnosed people, but a great refresher for those who have known about their diagnosis for a while. So that will be on um, Thursday, May 18th. But be sure to visit our website, uh, the events calendar there for all of these upcoming chapter wellness educational events. Um, and thank you again for joining us today. 
Um, Dr. Saad, so much for, for all of this information. We appreciate your time today. So we will see everybody next time. Thank you so much. Thank you bye for organizing this. Thank you. Bye.